Hi, I'm Brian Grant, and you're listening to On Time, the Brian Grant Foundation podcast about living with Parkinson's. If you want to know more about Brian Grant Foundation, go to briangrant.org. This podcast series is presented by AbbVie. People with Parkinson's have to anticipate and plan for a ridiculous number of things to leave the house. It's enough to make anyone anxious. Add to that the conversations we'll likely have about Parkinson's. It's easy to see why people start isolating, but socializing and connecting is one of the great joys in life, and it keeps us healthy. I'm here with co-host Brian Grant, and we're going to start by talking about our experiences with talking to others about Parkinson's disease. So Brian, tell us how you talk to people about Parkinson's when you're out and about. Well, it's funny you should ask that because in the beginning, I would wait for people to come and ask me a question or say something, but I found that over the years, it makes me feel a lot more comfortable to bring up the fact that I have Parkinson's, even though most of the time I know that the people that I'm talking to know that I have Parkinson's, it makes me feel better to get it kind of off my chest and takes away a little bit of the anxiety of the tremor or whatever I'm dealing with at that moment. When did you decide to go public? I decided to go public in 2000 and I think 2008 or 2009, but I knew I had it probably three months before I went public. And the thing that made me really decide to go was an event that took place at the Moda Center in Portland. I was at a game with Jerome Kersey sitting in the back and I was tremoring really hard and no, but no one knew that I had Parkinson's. So I turned to him and I said, man, I've got Parkinson's. And he said, what? I said, I have Parkinson's. And so he said, it's okay. You'll be all right. And I told him I was terrified to go out there because I didn't want people to see and to judge. And he said, just stay next to me. If it looks like things are going bad, I'll take you off the court. And so we went out there. I got through the evening that night, went home, watched the news and they showed us. And I was expecting to see this all over the place. And it was like, You couldn't tell, you know, so for us as Parkinson's patients, I know at least for myself, my, usually my tremor or my symptoms aren't as visible as I feel they are because to me they're raging, but to someone else, it may just be like a slight tremble. Right. It often feels like we are being shook from within, like someone has a handle inside us and they're controlling us. In addition to that, we can also have the feeling of being encased in wet cement. So those two things together might make us feel like we're literally going a bit crazy, whether people can see it or not. So that went pretty well. And he was the first person that you told publicly? He was the first person that I played ball with or against other than my family members that, you know, I, that I had PD. It was, it was a pretty big step because it led me to calling Rick Buecher from ESPN and basically giving him my story. And he, he sent a film crew up to Portland, Oregon and spent the whole day, did a really nice segment. It was a really good way to come out. And it, I think it answered a lot of questions to a lot of different people and organizations that I was expected to contact because I'd always said that I wanted to be a commentator or a news anchor for sports. And when I, those opportunities came up, I turned them down. And I'm sure people thought, well, who does he think he is? Well, I knew who I was. I just didn't know really what was going on. We are often judging others and ourselves by the only template that we know, and that's our personal experience. But how can we possibly explain the inconsistencies of a disease like this? So you really helped me out with something. When we were in Portland, you gave me a tip. Do you remember what that tip was? Giving out a few tips, and I I think the, was it the sitting on the head? Yep, and I used it that week on the plane ride back because I couldn't stop shaking, and the person next to me was just staring at me like, go away, you old weird lady. And so I sat on my hand, and I could contain the tremors. As simple as that sounds. Thank you. Well, you know, I would have gave you my other tip, but I found that people can kind of... uh, come to their own conclusions as to what's going on with you when you put your hands in your pockets and you're a man, (laughs) you know, your pockets are moving and you're sitting there with this look on your face like this. Yeah. I hear it up. 
I, I gave up putting my hands in the pocket. Good thing you have extra swagger and don't care too much what people think. I did have a friend that shares a similar experience, and at the end of the day, no one was even paying attention. And it is true. People are preoccupied with their own stuff, just like we are. So they aren't paying as much attention as we think, probably. But at the end of the day, the better strategy is just to speak out, like you said, because communication is key. I just let people know that I have Parkinson's, and I say it as soon and as simply as possible. Oftentimes, people don't know what to say when we tell them we have Parkinson's, and we get a variety of responses. What is one of the strangest things that you've heard, or maybe a common thing that people do to reply to you when they find out you have Parkinson's? I think one of the common things that I've heard from people is that a relative, a friend, or someone they're close to or know had Parkinson's, but they passed from it. And... It kind of takes me back a little bit, but I just look at them and say, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about that. But then I got to remind myself that, you know, I could have another disorder or disease that I, you know, my, where my time is, is limited. And, uh, with Parkinson's, at least, even though it's a nuisance, it gets in the way, it frustrates the heck out of me. I know that if I do the right things and take care of myself, then I can live, you know, just as long of a life as if I didn't have it. At least I think so. And if we're being real, nobody knows how much time they have. And we always think we have a lot of time. So we can live full on knowing that we might not have the kind of time we had planned. Nobody planned for this. But how did you think people would respond? For example, you, an NBA star, 12 seasons. Weren't you like the fifth pick? When you join, I mean, you, you're amazing. So people are probably floored. How did you think they would respond? Well, let me just, first of all, start off by saying, I think you're amazing. I think that the work that you do in the Parkinson's community is huge. I didn't know much about you. And one day I was just Googling Parkinson's and your name came up. I went to your site and saw your speeches and I was very inspired by that. Now, after saying all that, I forget what the hell the question was. I was saying, how did you think people might respond to finding out that you, the NBA star, had Parkinson's? In our minds, we tend to think that anything that happens is going to be this big, major blow up. And, uh, oh, my gosh, you have Parkinson's? And I think that was more or less what I was telling myself um, and doing to myself and it was the people that would come up and talk to me about it were the ones that calmed me down by like, hey, it's okay. You know, I had an uncle who had it. I have a cousin, a sister, a spouse, a friend. And just hearing their stories would calm me down and make me more receptive to what, what it is that they were telling me. What I really enjoy when I talk to you is that you have so much compassion and empathy for others. You can easily put yourself in their place and you don't make it all about you and your suffering. And being in service is exactly how we get through this, isn't it? Which is why I'm saying thanks so much it for the is. compliment. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Absolutely. So of the thousands of times I've told people, only once has someone been a real sort of jerk about it. And I try not to storyline or trip. And I notice that you don't either. You accept people for it just as they are. It reminds me of when I was accepting people into my dad's funeral. They come with their own pain, their own stories. It isn't really about us. It becomes a little different when it's close friends or family, though. You know, like if they can't accept it, that's their problem. Do you ever feel like you've lacked support or, or alternately, do you get extra support from places you never imagined and people you didn't know were going to show up? I'd say it's about my lazy kids. <laughs> no. They, you know, the support that I get from my children, the people that are closest to me has just been incredible, uh, the support, because not only have my kids had to go through everything that I'm going through with playing in the NBA, not being able to be home as much, and then afterward retiring, dealing with the retirement aspect of it, the divorce, things like that. They have stuck by me in times where... A lot of people would have ran or a lot of kids would have said, screw you, I'm not, 
I'm not hanging in here for that. But, you know, my kids have been my rock. And then there have been other people that have stepped up that I just didn't expect them to step up. And some people that I thought would come through didn't really come through. So I just really told myself, you cannot have any kind of expectations of people in the way that I feel that I see them helping or not helping out with me because expectations are usually just a pathway to a resentment. And I had to learn to take what people gave me and and accept things that didn't come my way. And one of the biggest ones was, you know, Carl Malone. You know, here's a guy that, you know, I became absolutely, I got, he gave me my fame by elbowing me in my eye. And, uh, you know, the whole basketball community and, of course, the Portland community all remembers that. But when it was, when it was over and done with, I had respect for him. He had respect for me. Now, fast forward, I'm diagnosed with Parkinson's. We're getting ready to have our, our event. And I get a phone call from Carl. You know, and say, hey, Brian, I heard that you get, you, you, you're not doing so well. I said, I'm doing okay. I just, I have Parkinson's. And he goes, well, that's why I'm calling. I just want to let you know anything I can do, I'm there for you. And, you know, that meant a lot. I meant a whole lot. And we ended up going on a fishing trip and raised $107,000 on one trip. And those type of things, you know, really got, got me because wasn't expecting him to do something. And then maybe there are a couple other friends of mine that I expected to step up. But when I really look back at it, I think a lot of my friends didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to approach me. I mean, let's face it. They remember old Brian too, you know, I've gone through a lot of changes and maybe they just didn't know how, how I would react to them offering help because they know that I'm the type of person that doesn't want anybody to pity. And maybe they felt like they would be doing that, going down that road with me, or I would perceive it as that. Precisely. They know you to be ferociously, fiercely independent, and they did not want to diminish that independence by saying, oh, poor you, which is what happens to me. I've learned about setting clear expectations, communicating, and preparing more than just the elevator speech. More than just that, I try to express as much as possible in detail what I'm going through. Not because I want to make it about me, because I want them to know that some of my reactions or behavioral patterns are entirely because of Parkinson's and the medications we take. So when you first told your friends and family, let's get a little bit more personal here. How did you first bring Mm -hmm. it up to them? I think my mother and my dad and people that were really close with me and uh, kind of following things as I would starting to go and see different doctors and neurologists. I think they kind of knew. They didn't want to say, yeah, you got Parkinson's, but I think they pretty much knew. But once I was officially diagnosed by Dr. Nutt in 2008, I started contacting people that really meant a lot to me, that I really cared about and I know would take the news well. And it was like my Aunt Jackie and my cousin Yvette Uh, my cousin Jermaine, family members like that. And um, everyone had the question that I had early on, and that was, you're going to be all right, man. It's it's not going to kill you, is it? And I go, I think there's certain types of Parkinson's that can kill you, but I don't know that I have that type. I think that, you know, I have a tremor, and I'll learn more about it. So it really became a learning thing for, for all of us. You know, as I would learn something in, they would press me like, what'd they say? And it got to the point to where, you know, I'd go to doctor's appointments and I'd had to take somebody with me because as new things started happening, I'd be down in the dirt, go home and forget what the hell it is I'm supposed to do because I'm emotional at the, at the doctor's meeting. So I'm hearing half the things he's saying and half the, the other half is going out the window. So I, I started going to those appointments with other people. But, you know, to to sum up your question, I just went to the people that I knew that I could go to and would have my best interests at heart. Yeah. People whom you could trust, even if they didn't understand, they would listen. 
and say, I hear what you're saying. That must be hard. What can I do? That would be the the best case scenario. So do you talk with them about it a lot now? If they ask, I, I kind of feel like we've, there's different levels of graduating to this with them. You know, there's the beginning where everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. What the hell is Parkinson's? We know Michael J. Fox and Ali has it, but we don't know. And so we kind of learn together and get to the next step. I think I'm at that plateau level now where people know that with the Parkinson's aspect of it, that I'm okay to a point where they don't have to keep it, you know, pressing me or asking me about it. But then there's some people that are really close to me that understand the disease that I'm going to go through changes. It's not going to be like it was, you know, the last year or two. And there are things that I can't control, like coming over to your house and trying to use the bathroom. I mean, I'm going to leave a mess on your toilet and your floor. <laughs> it's just going to be everywhere. I'll clean it up. But when Brian's coming over, you better lay out your, your, your bags and stuff in the bathroom or get a urinal for me. This is why you have so many dates. I always tell people that. You mean like dates, like like appointments like we have today? Is that the kind of date <laughs> you're talking about? Ah. Exactly. Right, right, right. I hear you. <laughs> so I had some similar experiences with people I hadn't seen since college. You know, they thought the old Heather would show up. And I'm sure you get a lot of that, the old Brian showing up. And they were amazed. And I spent my time soothing them because I didn't think to tell them before they arrived at my house what was happening. I just said, I have Parkinson's. So they're expecting a little bit of shaking because people don't know what Parkinson's is. They'd asked if I had a stroke. They were really concerned. One of them was going to call like 911 because I was a dance teacher. I taught hip hop. Now I'm, I'm bumping into the, the lamppost in the wall and shuffling around like Tim Conway. So this is all a reminder to us that clear communication is it. And it's on us to communicate that. If we fail to communicate, we will be judged by the template of the, what we call the normies or the people who are very healthy, relatively speaking, and can move about. How could they possibly know what we're going through? So it goes back to my original question, like, how do you present what you're going through in a clear way when you only have a minute? Let's say you're in an elevator, you walk in and everybody's looking at you and you think you're really shaking. What do you say? Do you try to make a joke or do you say nothing? Well, if I'm in an elevator and it's just me and another person and I'm shaking he heavily and I, I'll, I'll look at them, see what their eyes are doing. Most of the time they're looking down, trying to look out the side of their eyes. So I'll be like, I promise I'm not here to rob you or anything like that. I, I just, I have Parkinson's. So that's why I keep putting my hand in my jacket pockets. But you're okay. And they immediately, oh, no, no, not at all. It's okay. It's okay. And, I go, and then I, I make them feel better by saying, I just wanted you to know because that actually helps me. And then they're like, oh, I'm happy to help you. I'm glad you're not going to rob me. Of course, I say the same yeah. thing because people see me and they think she's going to rob me. <laughs> yeah, they see me and they think she's going to rob me. But you have the additional thing of being a large black man. So when you get on, they see you, they think he's strong. He's a big guy. And then they say, wait a minute, that's Brian Grant. So you can't go anywhere or get away with anything, can you? Do you have any um, costumes that you use? No costumes. I think we should try uh, this. In Portland, yeah, I can't get away with you. Can we try that sometime? Can't get away with nothing in Portland, but I go to other cities where I'm, um, people don't know. And that's a, that, yeah, the number one thing that I told Dr. Nutt, when he said, what's your biggest fear? I said, you know, most people like Diane. And I was like, my biggest fear is being 6'9", out in the public, out in the open space around a bunch of people, being dyskinetic, you know, having dyskinesias. Because you know, it's one thing to have the tremor, but when it develops to the point that you have dyskinesias, that, that's a tough one. And it's, yeah, it's pretty tough for 6'9", you know, 300 or less person. Or less, because we're working out every day. That's right. That's right. I'm on it. 
And when we rush, have you noticed we, we shake and we become even more dyskinetic? So I try to set expectations about being on time. I ask all my friends and coworkers for a window of time. And even today, notably, I was 10 minutes late. And you were gracious about that because you get it. But what about people who don't get it? How do you explain to them that you don't, you're not always going to be on time? Well, I think if I showed up on time that people would fall out like, damn, he's on time. <laughs> you know, you know it's not like he actually made it on time. Well, let's set up, you know. Now, with um, most people, I find that if we're having a bad PD day, that's what I call it in my in my life, a bad PD day, I can give a call and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm running 10, 15 minutes late. Is that OK? I'm kind of dealing with some things. And most people are very gracious and oh, take your time. We're here. We're just waiting. We're setting setting up. But then there's those appointments that we feel like we got to be there on time, if not on time, then early. Now, those, I, I've showed up to a couple of those where I wish I took the extra 10 or 15 minutes to wait on my meds and stuff, but I didn't. Now you get Brian Grant, who looks crazy because sweating profusely because of the anxiety of, you know, shaking and tremoring. Like, are you okay? Yeah, man, I'm good. <laughs> you know, I'm shaking and shaking and shaking. Then they're like, next time, just take the time, please. <laughs> I'm all over the place. So we can't hang out with people who are uptight or people who are strict machines with timing because preparation is the key. You know, we've got to tie our shoes, which might take an extra 10 minutes. We've got to start our car, find a parking spot, get in and out of places. And we have to try to do all this carrying things remembering where we're going. I mean, brain fog is part of this too. Preparation is key. Do you try to wear comfortable clothing and do they make comfortable clothing for your frame? Well, I tell you what, Katrina could probably tell you, Brian and I have, we, you know, we worked on my, commu my computer, but I guarantee you there's a black shirt and gray sweats that probably if Katrina was a betting person, she, she'd lay it down that I, I'd have it on when she sees it. Because I wear it like four times a week. Good thing you look because good at everything. Because it makes me feel good to be loose. Yeah, just loose and, you know, black shirt. Really, because it hides the sweating if I start to sweat. Yeah, I, I love loose fitting, comfortable clothes. I, I hate getting dressed up. She knows at the, at the galas. I got to have a room in the back with a fan going. So I'm sitting there like this in front of the fan because I've sweat through my, my suits before. And before I had PD, I was a sweater anyway. I, I would go through three jerseys a game. They knew they had one in the beginning at halftime and fourth quarter because they would just be soaked. And for our listeners, sweating is because we don't regulate our body temperature. This is a feature of Parkinson's, very common. We all struggle with it. And for the women, there's something extra called menopause because the men all pause. Anyway, we'll, we'll pass that one up. Menopause doesn't happen to men. Right. But the men I feel like all it. pause. Yeah, right. We're, we're going through it. So are there times where you're going <laughs> out or meeting somebody and you feel like you need to set expectations? And then if you do that, how do you really handle it? Like, let's say you're going on a date, your first date. What do you say to this person? You know, Heather, that's a very good question. And I've really been going through it probably the last 17 months, even before that, but really 17 months. I don't know what to say to people. I mean, I assume that people that I, that the, the couple of dates I've had over 17 months, only two couple, you know, I know that the people, the, the women knew that I had partners, but Still, that's really no comfort to me because I know when I'm around them, I get excited. I mean, just like to be in their presence and my tremor goes off. And you're sitting here trying to start some kind of a relationship, whether it be a friendly relationship or any kind of relationship. And the only thing I can think about is, I know she's got to be looking at me thinking, oh, in my mind's eye, it's like, the date's already over because I'm like, uh, date's over. She's like, I don't want to deal with that. Well, when it's not going well, I just, it, it, it just lowers 
everything in me, you know, I, I might be excited at the beginning of the date, but halfway through, it's like, I'm already ready to go home because I feel like I failed because I'm thinking for this individual. I'm thinking what I would think if I was in her position. Like, I don't want to deal with that. And traditionally, men aren't allowed to show vulnerability right away. Traditionally speaking. Yeah. I prefer well, yeah. it, but that's different. Well, I mean, that's all I do is show vulnerability. And then I start to think, she's going to think I'm not a man. She might be singing in her head salt and pepper. From seven to seven, he's got me open like seven and eleven. And yes, it's me that he's always choosing. He's always got my back. And he knows that my name is not Susan. I got a good man. Like she might be thinking, what a man, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. Heather's going, all a gangster than me. But you're going, oh man, I screwed this date up. And she's thinking, Star, she's like, tell me more. You know? So you never know, right? You never know, man. And you try to put yourself, I mean, for me, I, it, it's kind of been good to not be dating someone for so long because it makes me deal with my stuff just on my level. I don't have to worry about calling. I don't have to, you know, things that should be good things. I don't have to worry about them. But uh, the farther out you get, you start to wonder, like, damn, am I going to end up being alone? Or does that mean I got to look at Malia and I had taken care of my butt all the time? <laughs> yeah. I say that as a joke because they're whole college. But, um, yeah, man, it, it, dating is tough. I don't think people think about it. Yeah, for me, it's tough. And who doesn't fear rejection, whether we are healthy and in the normal range or not? I certainly fear it. And I often blame Parkinson's for pretty much everything. So I've tried to roll with it and acknowledge where I can do better and what I can be in control of and what I don't. And then I use humor and just kind of talk about the elephant in the room. I'll, I'll point it out because what else can we really do? So my icebreaker is to say something really stupid like, hey, what's shaking? And then pause. And if they don't laugh, I'm like, okay, you know, they don't. Or I'll just say, uh, you know, I'll just tell stories. No, I was just going to say on a serious note, the confidence, yeah, that's the, the biggest thing with me is the confidence is out the window. Not that I was overly confident in the past, but I have no real confidence. And that's one of the things I'm working on in 2022 is telling myself is, first of all, I'm okay, even if I am living with Parkinson's. And B, I do deserve somebody to love me and for me to love them back. And if that means I got to learn how to be more vulnerable in situations, then it's time for me to learn how to be more vulnerable. That means I need to step up and be a man in other situations. I need to step up and be a man. And for some of you people who are sick-minded, I'm just talking about, you know, opening the car door, that kind of stuff. So, Yeah, well, it must be hard to be so visible. Such a high-profile person in dating in the first place would have its complications. So how do you meet people? Do you already feel different before Parkinson's? I mean, how do you, what do you do? How do you meet people? Over the past 17 months, yeah, about the only way you can meet somebody would, for me, was internet, not Bumble or anything like that. But I, you know, I have a Facebook account and I have friends who say, hey, my friend wants to meet you, boom, that way. But in all honesty, if the bars and clubs and stuff were open up, I'm not going to go to the bars and the clubs because I'm not as that social. I'm just, I'm social at my house. If I have people at my house, friends over, uh, you guys come over, we'll be social, listen to some good tunes. I love playing music. Music is my thing. And I love to watch movies. How do you deal with needing help? Like, let's say that you're in a position of someone who's fairly new in your life and you're out and about and you and you suddenly find that you need some help. What do you do? Because I never know what to do. Help in what way? For example, this is very embarrassing, but I was on a date with this kind of just super hot person and I could not get out of the bathroom with my pants pulled up by myself. I had to text her from the bathroom and beg her to come in. Good thing we were the same gender, so it wasn't a problem in the bathroom and nobody even blinked an eye, but it was still really um, humiliating. She thought it was kind of hot, but whatever. I don't think so <laughs> at all. So what do you do? Well, I don't know, but I, I've been in that situation uh, 
with the whole going to the bathroom myself. And if there's not a urinal, even sometimes if there is a urinal, I can go crazy. And the thing that messes me up is if some of it gets on my pants. And now I'm in the bathroom, doing, trying to get it off. And then I come out and got one hand down and I see him look down and I'm like, okay, I had a tough time at the restroom. It's hard to, it's hard to hold stuff and, you know, you're shaking. And then kind of, I kind of make a joke out of it, but it's just like, you know, being here at the house, you know, the kids know I've, I've got gotten up to go to the restroom and I've had my kids, let me go first, dad. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> I'm not trying to miss the toilet. Yeah. That toilet doesn't want me. Well, to be fair though, if you're in a bar or a club, that happens with people anyway. I mean, it's kind of like walking into a preschool yeah. as no one's potty trained, clearly. Yeah, I, know the I know the next thing you're going to tell me is, why don't you sit down on the putt? I can't do that. Yeah, that's... It's just to take a pee. Cleanliness yeah. and stuff. Just, I mean, COVID aside, yeah. there's some stuff going on in bathrooms. Yeah, the COVID. That's, you that's know, what I don't you know. So uh, I wanted to also ask you, when you're on a first date, you're getting to know someone, and then we'll, we'll end the date portion of our, of our call here. So you're on a first date, you're getting to know someone. What are your thoughts? Like, how do you continue? Like, how do you even trust people who happen to know who you are? Do you always go with referrals, like somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody? Is that the best scenario? That's happened a couple of times. Prior to the 16, 17 months, I mean, I would just, somebody hit me on DM because of Facebook or something like that. But and if I don't know this person, like, I know, know them like I know you, I know Katrina, I know Brian, then it's always going to be a question mark as to, I'm always going to be questioning a lot of things like, why is she really here with me? When I was div divorced and going out, it would be, is it because I played basketball or whatever? It's, sometimes you just know, like, okay, if I wasn't this, then they probably wouldn't be, be here or want to go out. But then you get those ones that really, truly seem like they want to be there and they want to know about what's going on. But the better thing is, is to meet somebody who's had some experience with Parkinson's. That's my prayer is to come across somebody who's connected to the Parkinson's community, who's seen firsthand what it can and most likely will do to people, but because I can trust that, you know, she's coming into this thing knowing the what ifs. Now, I may not have that much of a tremor or, or look normal that night, but I still know that they know the ugly, ugly face of, of Parkinson's. And you that makes dealt, sense. It does. And you've dealt with projection before, where someone sort of falls in love with their idea of who they think you are instead of the real you. As you are right now, can you be accepted by another human being right now? now right here. So come as you are has been a big theme for us. So I've been in places where I've wondered, am I worthy of love? Will this person accept me that I'm now that I'm disabled? And that's a hard word for me to say that I'm disabled because when I'm off, I get really insecure. And the reality is there will be people that aren't going to call me back. They won't like me anyway. And that's how it goes for everybody. But I wanted to ask you a little bit more about this thing that I call catastrophic thinking. There are a lot of reasons people don't call back or reject us, and we know not to take it personally, but it's hard not to get into that stinking thinking that, you know, like, what's wrong with me? When in fact, there's nothing wrong with you. You're coming as you are, and Parkinson's is non-negotiable. It's like a third party that wasn't invited coming along. So how do you stay upbeat? Well, you know, that's where the depression comes in sometimes, too. You know, sometimes I just don't feel like doing anything. And I think it's because I have PD, but it could be about the part of depression that I'm going through that I'm not realizing at the time. And let's face it, we all have to look at ourselves and be honest about who we are. Who is Brian Grant? Brian Grant can be a very lazy person. You know, I, I can't, I'm just being honest. I can be lazy. I love being in the comforts of my home. Captain Love Lynch. movies. Watch movies all day all night. Captain and, Crunch. Uh, when I haven't had any Captain Crunch in oh, quite a few okay. years. Good. Yeah. 
It's, it's cinnamon toast crunch now. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. But uh, that, that's the first thing is being honest with myself. And, you know, I dated a couple of people and that were constantly on me. You don't do anything. You just sit around and I was like, that's what I do. You know, but I do need to get up or at least because I have the same, ex, uh, I could have false expectations of them as well. Right. What I think they are. And then when they don't turn out to be that, am I going to accept it or am I going to like, ah, she's, she's not perfect. She's not perfect. And I can't be mad when people do that to me because let's face it, you know, a lot of people don't want to sit at home and watch movies, you know, yeah. listen to music and then get out every once in a while. Sounds good to me, but I didn't really date for about four years. I mean, Parkinson's meds have changed my behaviors and DBS, deep brain stimulation, has changed my behaviors and my patterns. I was so angry about having Parkinson's to begin with. I was furious. I couldn't have been pleasant to be around, and I was drinking a lot back then. So to, to say that I was a good partner to anyone would be a stretch. But, you know, I can blame a lot of people for my loneliness and my, my disgust and my anger. But really, the inner work, it requires, like, Parkinson's asks a lot of us. And I noticed that you've been doing the inner work. I noticed that you've been showing up in that ruthless inventory of yourself. You've been doing a lot of reflecting, a lot of deep thinking. What a beautiful human being Parkinson's has made each of us in many ways. It has humbled us. And for me, isn't that kind of what Absolutely. it's all about? I mean, if we want a chance of love, we have to be broken down and open. What would you say to all that? Like, Yeah, I think my problem was is I've had, I've had three women that really loved me. And I think, you know, the first one was college. I was just too young. I was fresh out of the country into the city at a school where basketball was it. So it was a lot of people coming at you. And then there was. Starry eyed. Who. You know, it, I mean, she, she was the love of my life and. It was easy for me to say she's the love of my life, but what does that mean if you're not faithful, if you're not committed the way she is? She was committed, and I was young, and I was going to do what I was going to do when I wanted to do it. And so I've had to go through my own bumps and bruises after putting several women through their stuff. You know, it was my turn to go through it, and it was like, I didn't like that. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes it. but. It's like you say, you know, then throw Parkinson's into the mix. It humbles you and it humbled me enough to look at my past behavior and realize that there are a lot, a lot of changes that needed to take place. Not just the ones because of Parkinson's, but, you know, who I am. And, you know, I think a lot of times I didn't want to do interviews because I thought there was a fault vision as that people had about who I was. Right. I was that person, but I was also this person too. So. Right. We can be a million people just in one day and hour by hour, our capability levels change. But if we're caught in that cycle of stinking thinking that says this one person is my only chance at love, it's not true. We know there are many fish in the sea or I'm not worthy of love. This is not true. We are all worthy of love. I can communicate better about this disease so that my partner or potential partners can be part of it. They're invited into my world, not my defining feature. Same thing with you, I noticed. It doesn't define you, but it does dictate some of your activities. So you know that you're worthy of love, and I do too. And we've talked a lot about this, Brian. We talked about songs of heartbreak, and because this happens to everybody, you know, it's not, nothing it's unique about the Parkinson's, and we don't. We're not martyrs here. We're, we're doing this podcast so that people can understand better and feel a little less alone. So we were going to ask everybody for their favorite heartbreak songs. And what are your heartbreak songs, Brian? I Try by Angela Bofield. I really like that. I mean, it's... Hurts. Hurt me already. Right? Look, she's pleading for love. I mean, she's pleading for love. Like, I try. It, it's just a great song. You're hurting me a little. Um, what's that with Angela? Yeah, I like that one. But I'm just going to stick with Angela Bofield. I can go into the barge 
You know, the barge has a couple songs. Can't you see that you're hurting me? Saying. And I want this pain to stop. So if you really care, if you really, really care, then open up your heart to me. Angela. Right there. Angela Bofu. And then you said DeBarge. And you have mentioned before our friend Raphael Sadiq. Oh, yeah. Great tunes. Yeah. I, I just love his music. Special. He's uh, one of the true artists left in the world. And ultimately... I can't say that about everybody. Yeah. And ultimately, aren't we all looking for love? Are we all learning to love ourselves better so that we can be better partners, community members, parents, friends, lovers? Like we, we want to be better. So we hope that some information shared here was helpful. The Brian Grant Foundation is dedicated to this community and beyond. For more than just education, they offer such a plethora of classes and information that you can't get anywhere else. It is unique. So come on by the website and check out the latest offerings. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. Please stay tuned for part two, where we discuss parenting with Parkinson's. The Brian Grant Foundation provides tools to improve the well-being of people with Parkinson's. You can help us make a difference in the lives of people with Parkinson's by donating online at briangrant.org. AbV is dedicated to helping people with Parkinson's get more on time in the day. AbV is the presenting sponsor of this podcast series. Visit briangrant.org slash podcast to learn more. And a special thank you to Raphael Sadiq for providing the music for this podcast. This podcast is produced by Brian Griggs and Griggs Productions. Learn more at griggsproductions.com.